Uh, I, I literally go to do something else and like a million things happen. Okay. We are basically in the last half of the course now, okay? So you've got four regular exams and a final exam, okay? We've got two exams down. We're picking up with the last half of stuff. What we're doing now is gonna switch gears just a little bit this week, next week, a little bit after spring break and talk about the immune system, okay? Most of you have not had the immune system much, if at all, in anything that you've learned. So while metabolism sucked, right? You had at least heard of aerobic respiration. You had at least heard of ATP and that kind of stuff. This for the most part is going to be all new. So we have to take some of those misconceptions and try and correct them. Um, we're gonna spend time talking through all of your immune system and how it works. And then we're gonna come back to our microbiology and our immunology. And we're gonna put them together to talk about how you fight diseases and how that happens, okay? So we're gonna spend a little bit of time now, really the next three weeks-ish, talking through the immune system and how it works. Then we'll go back to, okay, now that we know how that happens, what happens when you get an infection? How does your body fight it off? When it can't fight it off, how does that work? So all of those things are kind of coming full circle. Typically speaking, the hardest exams in the class are exam two and exam three. Exam two, because everybody hates metabolism. And exam three, because the immune system is all new to you. Okay, so don't let up when it comes to this next exam. Um, you're going to need all of this content because that's how you understand the last bit of stuff in the, in the semester. Typically speaking, exam four grades go up because as long as you then understood this and can apply it, that last little bit is easy peasy in getting through the different diseases. If you can't get through this, that last exam becomes really hard to get through because it is truly application of everything that's been put up uh, until now through the semester, okay? So we have class this week, we have class next week, we then have spring break. My advice to you is really going to be, don't do nothing over spring break. Use spring break to at least take some time every day and do a little bit of work on this, whether that's reading the chapter, whether that's reviewing this stuff, um, all of that is going to be helpful. When it comes to innate and adaptive immunity, there is a lot here, a lot, okay? Um, we are covering it only in what you need in terms of the course and in terms of our learning objectives. So you need to know what's in the lecture notes. If you're someone who's been reading the textbook, you're reading the book and you're like, oh gosh, we're down a pathway that we didn't talk about in class. Skip to the next section because there is a lot here. Um, when I was an undergraduate taking microbiology at a place that will not be named, okay? <laughs> this, it was two separate classes. Microbiology was its own semester. Immunology was its own semester. You can literally spend 16 weeks going through just the stuff in the next two chapters. We're not doing that because we're only taking it from kind of a high level standpoint. You can find a lot of videos on the internet, a lot. However, half the time they go into way more detail than you need and give way too much information. So again, you know, you take the internet with a grain of salt with this kind of stuff. Some things can be really helpful like the Amoeba Sisters, we were talking about those before. They have some awesome videos. Most of the videos are pretty good. Some of the videos go into too much depth. So um, use that kind of stuff with a, a bit of a grain of salt when you're moving forward. Sound good? Questions? 
um, before, while I'm thinking of it, for lab this week, there is no pre-lab, okay? We are working our way through Appendix 1 in your lab manual. Appendix 1 is going to be a repeat of the streak plate and a repeat of the gram stain. So on Thursday, we're going to get started with exercise eight. We're going to look at those results. We should be done with that in about 45 minutes. And then we're going to spend the rest of the time doing the gram stain and streaking a new plate because next week you start the unknown experiment. And so it all kind of comes full circle and works through that. So um, I am hoping that on Thursday, we have a little bit of time to talk about the unknown experiment at least in a cursory fashion, because then the pre-lab and everything is gonna become available. In that folder is a grading rubric and all kinds of things that I wanna make sure we have a little bit of time to discuss on Thursday, okay? So no pre-lab, but we're practicing our gram staining and our street plating again. So super important to prep us for the unknown experiment, okay? So when we say your immune system, what do we think of? What, do you, what comes to mind? White blood cells, that is an awesome. Yeah, collect. Fights diseases, awesome. Antibodies, awesome. Okay, yeah, collect. Very, very, very bad. I was, I was born with Lots of hospitals, lots of, hospitals, <laughs> lots of things. So we're going to try it. We're going to talk through how it works, and then we'll cover a little bit about what happens when it goes awry. And we'll, you've lived it, so you can speak to some of that process. So when we say your immune system, or you say, when you say I'm immune to something, all that is that your white blood cells are working to fight something off. It could mean that you've made antibodies and those antibodies are actively fighting something off, okay? It depends on exactly what you've got, how long you've had it. Is it the first time you've seen it? Is it the second time you've seen it? All of those things play a role in this particular process, okay? So what we're gonna talk about, we're gonna break apart your immune system into two parts. Today, we're gonna to get through most of the innate immune system. And that is the immune system that we all have that should act equally in all of us. That's the part of our immune system that doesn't really care what it is. It just knows that something is present that doesn't belong and then it works to fight it off, okay? Then we're gonna come to the adaptive immune system. And the adaptive immune system is what changes over time. The adaptive immune system is what becomes specific for what you're fighting off. Yeah. Do you also call it acquired? Yes. Okay. Yes. Adaptive immune is immune system is also referred to as acquired immunity. Yep. And because of acquired response, it develops over time, it adapts over time. Um, and in theory, the more times you see something, the more specific your immune system becomes in fighting it off. Okay. Uh, but when you get an infection, it really is kind of a battle between your cells, your white blood cells, and then the cells of that organism that are coming in or that virus that's coming in and how many virus particles are present, okay? So a few things. We are going to talk about the blood system because it's impossible to talk about your immune system without going back to all of those white blood cells and how they work. Your immune system is always working. So it's not just that it works when you get sick. It's always working. It's always watching. There's always something going on. Okay. Um, you know, you can think about this in a number of different ways. You know, this is big brother always monitoring you, if you will. Okay. But this is also, you know, how many of the ways in which you have to be, you know, in control of your environment at any one point in time, right? Do you, you know, I got a ring doorbell, right? I can constantly look outside my front door at any point in time that I want to. We have apps for everything nowadays, right? I can turn on lights when I'm not home. I can do all of this stuff to monitor everything. Your immune system is kind of like that. Even though you are doing something else, it's always working in the background and monitoring everything and making sure it's fine and everything's good. 
When you get an infection, those cells of the immune system are going to increase, okay? Because they, rep they recognize that there's a risk there, there's a problem, and they need more cells to fight off that particular component to it. We are really going to focus on what happens when you get an infection in regard to the immune system. We are not going to go into all kinds of detail about other human conditions and what happens with the immune system. So we're not talking about arthritis. We're not getting into, you know, celiac disease and how that's impacting your immune system and what's happening there. We're going to focus on what's happening when you get an infection or some form of microbial invasion in regard to your immune system. So this is not every disease you've ever heard of. It's not immunology with respect to human biology necessarily. We're really talking about it to connect to that mi microbiology component here. So those numbers are going to increase during infection. So if you ever go in and they take a blood sample and they do a white blood cell count, simple process, they're doing that to see if your numbers are elevated. If those numbers are elevated, that automatically tells them chances are there's something going on that we need to look more into, okay? Um, cells of the immune system play roles in both components. So they're going to play roles in your innate immunity, which is going to be kind of those first responders. They're also going to play roles in adaptive immunity, which is that immunity that develops over time. Okay. Yeah. Um, sorry to backtrack a little bit. Um, what happens when you don't have enough like immune cells in your blood? When you don't have enough immune cells in your blood, you lose the ability to react. So that's typically going to mean that something you would normally fight off, you can't. So you're basically immunocompromised. Um, you know, that could make it harder to fight something off. That could mean you die because you can't fight something off. That could simply mean you're more reliant on antimicrobial medications to try to fight. Okay. Yeah. Oh, because they are human cells, it's a type of eukaryote. Um, so we'll get into a little bit about the cell structure in just a minute, but because it's coming off of you and you're a eukaryote, all those cells in that population are eukaryotic. Yeah. Adaptive immunity is typically why they have to build it up over time. So they get way more infection early on in life because you're you're trying to build up those cells that will also lessen with time over well. So over to, over time as well. So that's also why elderly individuals are tend to be more susceptible as well. Yeah. So yes, so your immune system is going has to build up its ability to work. But once you hit a certain age, you're not doing as good a job making new white blood cells anymore and their ability to react. So your immune system lessens over time as well. So we're going to talk about the blood cells and how they form. We all have to have all types of white of blood cells, not only for the immune system, right? But your red blood cells are important in carrying oxygen. Okay, so we need good blood cell development. The process of blood cell formation is referred to as hematopoiesis. That hematopoiesis is coming from stem cells that are in your bone marrow. So when you hear of people who have a bone marrow transplant, the reason they're getting that bone marrow transplant is because they need these stem cells that make blood cells. So that person's blood cells are not functioning properly anymore to make new blood cells for one reason or another. That bone marrow transplant gives them back those stem cells and gives them back that ability to produce those different cell populations. So, you put a cell in your bone marrow. It's known as a hematopoietic stem cell. Does everybody see how the cell type at the top 
has arrows to all of these cells at the bottom. It means the hematopoietic stem cell has the ability to become every single type of blood cell that's here. When it starts to divide, it becomes more and more specialized. So from this original hematopoietic stem cell, it divides into two types of cells, which are known as progenitors. One type of progenitor is gonna become all of your lymphocytic cells or your lymphocytes, okay? The other type of progenitor is going to become all of your red blood cells, your platelets, and then specific types of white blood cells um, known as granulocytes, and then the monocyte macrophage dendritic cell lineage as well, okay? So once it starts to divide, it becomes, it gets more specialized, more specialized, more specialized. I don't care that you know every cell type in the middle here. You need to understand that there are stem cells in your bone marrow that can become every type of blood cell. And then in the end, you need to understand that you're gonna make red blood cells, which are called erythrocytes, which are gonna be responsible for carrying oxygen. You are going to make platelets, which are known as thrombocytes. Who knows what those are responsible for? Clotting. Okay, so we got to be able to clot. Um, you can make a specific type of cell known as a mast cell. We're going to talk about those a little bit later when we get into um, allergic reactions and how those work. And then everything here in this other box is a type of white blood cell. So you've got lots and lots of different types of white blood cells. Each one of these is going to have a specific job, okay? We're gonna spend a lot of time talking about B cells and T cells and how they work. That's essentially a lecture and a half's worth of stuff, okay? It's a lot. So these guys are more specialized. These other cell types in the way here, are a little bit more generic in terms of how they work, okay? But each one of them is gonna have a specialized job. Uh-oh. What's that? Yeah, right? Here we go, okay. Is that they give you an awesome table with the cell type and the location and the functions. You want to know your blood cell types and what they do. If you don't know your blood cell types and what they do, you're gonna have a hard time understanding the immune system and how they work, okay? So we're gonna break these apart. We're gonna talk about different blood cell types at different points in time over the next few weeks. Um, we're going to start, we're going to have a good conversation about the granulocytes, okay? The reason they are called granulocytes, do you see all these little dots in the center, okay? They look grainy under the microscope, okay? Um, so the granulocytes come in three forms, neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils, okay? I remember this as granny and the three fills. I don't know why, don't ask me, okay? I just know that if I see fill on the end, I know it's gotta be a type of granulocyte. So I know when I look at it, it's got those granules and those granules are gonna help with different immune components, okay? Um, neutrophils in particular account for a large proportion of your white blood cells. Um, they are upwards of 65% of the different white blood cells that are in circulation. Um, guys, their main job is to do phagocytosis and eliminate anything that doesn't belong. So these guys are like giant little like Pac-Man guys all going around in your body, finding things that don't belong and just eliminating them. Okay, so you have large numbers of them because they need to be able to eliminate large portions of cells. We will talk a little bit more about eosinophils and basophils later, but you can see two to 4% for eosinophils, zero to 1% for basophils. These are participating in inflammatory reactions. These can participate in um, the components of inflammation, but also allergy, allergy reactions as well. Um, 
So it really just depends. The eosinophils are important if you get an infection with a parasitic worm, something really nasty, yeah, right? Like you don't want. Um, in that situation that you will get more of those that are produced, but the main one that's gonna be around are gonna be the neutrophils at any one point in time. Um, when we talk, when we say that they're circulating, when they are circulating, that means they're going through your bloodstream. That means they have the ability to get into every tissue and then move their way around your body, okay? Um, we will talk a little bit about the mononuclear phagocytes as well. Go back to that last slide. So the mononuclear phagocytes, you can see here they're monocytes. And the monocytes differentiate into macrophages and dendritic cells, two different populations. But we also have these important cells that are monocytes as well. They're actually known as monocytes in the bloodstream. When they leave the blood and they go into your tissues, they can actually then differentiate, which means to change, into uh, macrophages or dendritic cells. But all three of these are all together um, in one particular um, grouping that's known as your mononuclear phagocytes. A phagocyte is just something that engulfs things and eliminates them. You're gonna see that term a lot. Um, so your monocytes and your macrophages do have the ability to phagocytose and digest anything. The dendritic cells are a little bit different because they gather the antigen and then they bring it to your B and your T cells. Um, I think of the kind of these cells that destroy things and, and just eliminate them and don't worry about them. The dendritic cells are more like little tattletales. They don't wanna get their hands dirty. They don't wanna you know, participate in much, but they wanna tell everybody else what they found, okay? Like you know, your cat brings you a dead mouse and gives it to you, right? Versus the dog that like just tears it up and leaves it. I would think your dog's not dealing with it. Then. Who knows? I had a dog one time that would catch him and like throw him in the air. And then she'd bring it to you and she'd be like, it doesn't squeak anymore. <laughs> yeah. Um, so with the neutrophils, the monocytes and the macrophages, basically the difference between those is like just the location of the body. Just the location of the body. And the, the neutrophils, the neutrophils are going to go everywhere that the monocytes and macrophages can go. But the monocytes will only be in the blood and the macrophages will only be in the tissue. So in the blood, you can find monocytes and neutrophils. And in the tissue, you can find neutrophils and the macrophages. So they can, they can be in the same spots at the same time. Um, there's typically smaller numbers of the monocytes and the macrophages. We'll get to dendritic cell. Oh, we talked about those a little bit. Um, but we'll get to their connection with the lymphocytes and how those work next week. Um, anytime you hear of something like your B cells or your T cells, those are the same thing as your B lymphocytes and your T lymphocytes. So the names are all the same. Uh, you will see it referred to both of those um, equally. We're going to spend some time next week talking about those. Those can be anywhere from 25 to 35% um, actively in your circulation. Um, it varies over time and it also varies if you get an infection. So if you've got an active infection that they're fighting off, your lymphocyte number can actually increase. So all of these numbers are subject to change when you've got some level of infection that's going on. Um, it really just depends on what's happening at any point in time. The reason you've got them around, constantly need to be on the lookout for some sort of item that doesn't belong, okay? You know, you're constantly inhaling things, right? Stuff happens. Mm -hmm. You get strep throat and you have no idea how you got it, right? It, it came in somehow, right? Or, you know, I had one last week. I swear it's not COVID. And the next day I got an email and said, okay, it's COVID, okay? They have to constantly be there to work things out, to identify things, to find them, um, and then eliminate them. If they were never there, and then you got sick, and then they had to be upregulated to fight things off, that's gonna take way too much time. And that's gonna be time you need to fight that particular pathogen off. When we say these guys, you make more of these guys, 
guess what? Lots of ATP and things like that are needed to make more of those cells. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the, the question is, if you go symptomless for COVID, is that part, is that because of this? And the answer is yes, that is partly because of it. One of those things that we're going to really talk about is how an organism, a pathogen, if you will, that causes infection and disease can look different in every one of us because our immune systems are different. So the signs and symptoms that Colette has with her half-functioning immune system are going to be different than somebody who's got all of those immune system cells and something that's going to work. So exactly right. What you see, what you experience is partly due to the organism. It's also partly due to your immune system and how it's working. Yeah. So if you know someone has an infection, yeah. you can theoretically use this information. So you can leave that to localize it. Um, once you find some of these cells, that will help tell you what it is and where it's at. Um, so you have to do a little bit more analysis, but what you see can help you understand where that particular pathogen is and what it could be doing. Know your blood cell types and you'll be good to. These work really awesome with some flashcards. Okay. Um, yeah. I don't know if I misheard you. Can you explain what a mast cell is? So, a mast cell, so mast cells are here. They're also referred, they're with the basophils as well. Um, the mast cells are typically going to be involved in, in allergic reactions. Um, basophils as well. So they're they're kind of going along with that point. We're not going to get too much into those now, but we'll cover them a little bit later. Okay. I know this photo is grainy for some reason. Okay. <laughs> Remember it's a monocyte in the blood and then it differentiates into either being a macrophage or a dendritic cell when it heads out into the tissue. Um, again, you're going to see that word differentiate a lot. Differentiate simply means to change. Okay. Um, the two most common terms that we're going to keep coming back to are the words proliferate and differentiate. Proliferate means to make more. Differentiate means to change. Lots of your cells have the ability to differentiate or to change depending on what cellular cues are present. Okay. So in this case, the monocytes can change into either macrophages or dendritic cells, depending on the cues that they're presented via transcription, translation, and all of that fun kind of stuff, okay? Um, we're gonna get to all of those and how they work. The dendritic cells are cool because they function like little scouts, and again, just like little tattletales. Um, you can think of this as kind of, these white blood cells are basically your own little personal army, okay? They are your army, they are your navy, they are your, you know, SEAL Team 6. They do everything inside of your body that needs to be done to battle these foreign invaders that are coming in. The dendritic cells themselves are interesting because they only fun they, they function more as these scouts that are going to go around. They're going to find things that don't belong and then they're going to bring them back. Like this is like, you know, you're watching some battle and the, you know, the guy goes ahead of the rest of the group to see what's out there and then comes back and reports before the entire army moves forward. Okay, um, that's essentially kind of what dendritic cells are doing. Um, the macrophages, on the other hand, have the ability to do all kinds of phagocytosis and antigen presentation. So all of these cells are there to be specialized with a job to help kill off whatever is there that doesn't belong. Okay. like a relatively simple diagram, okay? We're going to keep coming to it over the next couple of weeks of lecture. When we say your immune system, we're talking about all of this together. 
When we say host defenses, you are the host, right? Something is invading you and trying to live off of your body, okay? So you are the host. This is what defenses do you have to fight against whatever that invader is? And these host defenses come in two forms. The first form is known as your innate defenses. They're also nonspecific. Anybody know what innate means? You're born with it. You automatically got it, okay? So everybody has two lines of defense that you are born with. They're also non-specific. In other words, they don't care what comes in. They just know it doesn't belong, okay? I don't need to see it. I hear it. I know it's there. I don't need to identify it. I just need to eliminate it, okay? that is crawling across the ceiling. I just know I want it gone and I'm going to hit it with a shoe. Okay. That's what I do. Right. Okay. These guys, they move from kind of one line of defense to the next. So there is a bit of a progression here, but at the same time, they all have to be working together. So your innate and non-specific defenses come in two different components. The first line of defense, the first line of defense says prevent things from coming in to start with. To get sick. That's the goal of the first line of defense. There are three components with this. The physical barriers, your skin, right? Your skin is a nice physical barrier. It's thick. It's got lots and lots of cells to it. The outer layers are dead. It's not, it's, that's like that on purpose, okay? Uh, the other component that you have are your mucous membranes. All up your nose, in your mouth, down through your digestive system is all lined in a mucous membrane. What that means is that it's lined with mucus. We're gonna have some good, fun discussions about all kinds of great things that you don't wanna talk about, okay? Mucus is really just like, thick stuff. You take these teeny tiny little bacteria and you put them in this mucus and they go, oh, I can't go anywhere. Like I've been slimed. Like Ghostbusters. Okay. This section works great for some good examples. You'll remember those on the exam and you'll all spit them right back up and they'll all be good. Okay. We got to prevent things from coming in. You also have chemical barriers at that first line as well. This is something that I think we typically don't think about, right? Try, what happens? You blink, what else do you do? You tear up, your eyes water, right? You do that, that's an immediate reaction. Guess what? Your tears have antimicrobial compounds in it. They are naturally going to get rid of microbes. Your saliva has antimicrobial compounds in it, okay? You, um, you sweat. Sweat has what in it? Salt. Is salt good for bacteria? The higher solute concentration outside, what happens to water? Goes out, right? So that's truly antimicrobial. What does your stomach make? Bacteria? No, destroys them, right? So you naturally have all kinds of chemical components which are naturally antimicrobial. Whether you wanna think of them as your own little like Lysol supply or whatever, totally up to you, okay? But you naturally make these compounds that go, all right, bacteria, I'm just gonna destroy you, okay? And those line in these membranes. They're trying to prevent things from coming in. What are we gonna say? Okay. The bodily things that all do that kind of stuff. We're gonna get into more in a minute. Okay. There are also genetic components that influence this, okay? You all know that person who just like never gets sick, right? No matter, like, why is it you don't get sick? 
there's like, this is not an experiment. Like, let's see if we can give them COVID or something like that, but they're more resistant or other individuals who are naturally more susceptible to getting sick, right? Maybe they don't make a good immune system or don't have other good components. Their genetics influences that. Another example, have you heard of sickle cell anemia? Okay. But their red blood cells look like a sickle, okay? Kind of like a crescent moon, if you will. It's not a nice rounded red blood cell. Red blood cells don't have a nucleus in the center because they cut, so they kind of look depressed in the center, like a donut ish sort of, okay? Um, that sickle shape, they cannot get malaria. Malaria is a specific parasite that infects red blood cells. Malaria is not capable of infecting someone with sickle cell anemia. So their genetics play a role in terms of how they get disease and what disease they get, okay? So the first line of defense says, look, we're here, but we're gonna try and block things from getting in to start with. If we can prevent you from getting sick, that's gonna be a good thing. The second line of defense says, whoa, someone asked your first line of defense. We need to immediately take action and try and do something about it, okay? So the second line of defense kicks in really quickly. You actually have an alarm signal that goes off. So when something gets past your first line of defense, you actually have a series of chemical signals that go out that say, holy smokes, something got past the first line. Here is where it's at. Everybody come and try and fight this off. You have four components of defense, which are all gonna work to try and immediately eliminate something, okay? That are hanging back a little bit, okay? They're being quiet, they're watching, okay? They're waiting for the right time for them to call, be called to action and to do their job. The third line of defense, is indeed your last line of defense, okay? They are it, right? But they are known as acquired and specific. So they make a very specific response against that one thing. They take their time, they research it first, they look at what it is, they try and figure out the best mode of action to go against it. And they make a response against that one thing, okay? Sort of like we're gonna monitor a Chinese spy balloon that's you know hanging out for like a week. And then we're gonna take action when we know it's the right time to shoot it down and no one gets hurt, okay? The third line of defense is involved in all kinds of different things. There, this can work on its own. So you can acquire this naturally. You got COVID. If you got COVID, your body made antibodies against that virus all on its own, okay? You can get antibodies from your mother. None of you have any antibodies left from your mom, sorry, okay? Those are all gone, like, by the time, well. You can get antibodies naturally. They flow through the placenta. Uh, mom also gives antibodies if she is breastfeeding, okay? And they'll stick around a good three or four months until that process has been done. Um, and then after that, they, they're they pretty much gone after that, okay? Yeah. Say that again. Oh, RH positive versus negative. So we are gonna get into that later. Um, RH positive, your red blood cells have what are called antigens that are on the surface. Um, your RH factor is the positive or negative component in your blood. You get that from your parents. That's a genetic component. Um, you only need one copy of it to be positive. When there is an issue with your RH factor between mom and child, is that like what you're referring to? So that's, tip, that's when mom's blood is negative and baby's blood is positive. So that has to happen because dad is positive and dad contributes that positive gene, genetically speaking, but mom doesn't have it. Mom makes antibodies against it and that can fight off the fetus. We're gonna go through all of that in a couple of weeks. Yeah. So um, you said like they could uh, give um, maternal antibodies through like um, breastfeeding. Yeah. Um, is that like throughout the entirety of the breastfeeding or is it like 
most concentrated like at the beginning and then like kind of dies off. So, because I know like, because some people like breastfeed for like two years. Yeah. For like the same baby. So like, so initially in milk production, there it's going to be a little bit more concentrated. That's why they um, colostrum. Exactly. Um, but you'll still have a good amount over time. As long as she's, as long as mom's actively making milk, you'll actively keep producing those antibodies that are in there. But that initial one is going to be higher. Okay. Yeah. So, um, and then you can also develop this, what we are calling artificially. Don't think of it as being fake. Think about it as just priming the immune system through some other form. So if you got a COVID vaccine, you still made antibodies. You just got them through that medical intervention as opposed to getting the COVID virus on your own, okay? Um, we can give you antibodies only. Um, patients who are going through chemo, radiation, who have compromised immune systems, um, they will typically give them just antibody fractions. Okay? You can go in and donate plasma. In the plasma fraction are the antibodies. So they can take that antibody fraction from your plasma and they can do all kinds of different things with it to give it to individuals who are compromised in other ways. Yeah. Even if you're just giving the normal blood, they can still... They will, they will still separate it. Um, oh yeah, they separate it. But I think there was... Well, I was donating blood after I got a vaccination. Yep. And they said that I had like super whatever's like antibodies for it was for COVID. Yes. And they said they used those for treatment and low. Exactly. So and because there are different forms of there are different ways you can give blood. You can just give the plasma. So they give you back all the red blood cells. You can give a whole blood sample. And when they take the whole blood, they automatically fractionate it out so that they use those antibodies for what they So far, so good. Three lines of defense, okay? They're going to work. The first ones prevent you from getting sick. Once something gets past the first line of defense, the second line of defense is going to kick in. The second line of defense is going to keep working. And at the same time, it's going to try and recruit and activate this third line of defense, okay? Um, the third line of defense can really take up to two weeks to build good antibodies in your system. But while this is building up, the second line of defense is going to keep working and trying to prevent um, and trying to get rid of it. Okay. okay I have one more. Yeah. So when there's a baby, yeah, and you know, but the person carrying the baby, yeah, they receive like the male black. So there are no antibodies contributed by dad at all. So the only thing that's going to come through that's going to do anything is going to be the sperm, and that's only going to contribute the genetic information. Dad has very little part in this entire process. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the third line of defense, does it start right when the second line of defense starts? It there's, just takes longer for it takes to longer. You're going to have some components of the second line of defense that will go back and, and recruit that third line. It will take a couple of days for that process okay. to happen, um, but you're going to want it to kick in relatively quickly if possible. It's not going to be at the exact same time. Another way of looking at the same diagram we talked about on the last slide, okay? So our goal of the first line of defense, which is really at our skin and our mucous membranes, is to prevent something from getting in. The minute a microbe gets in, it is known as microbial invasion. Something has gotten past your first line of defense. At that, at that juncture, you are going to have what are known as sensor systems that are all going off. These are little receptors that are on your cells. These are proteins that are in your blood. And they are meant to identify things that do not belong, okay? This is like not only you got a ring doorbell, but you got cameras all around the outside. Maybe you got cameras inside as well, okay? 
and went to my mother's house. She put cameras in all kinds of different places. You could tell me before I showed up that there are cameras like watching me wherever. Okay. Same in your body. Your body is like one giant, you know, ADT alarm system, if you will. It's got components everywhere that are looking for where are those invaders and what's going to happen. So you've got some that are just going to function as recognition receptors and proteins. And those guys are going to um, ultimately call for help from components of the second line of defense. You have other components, um, which are known as the complement system, which are in your blood. And these guys can call for components of the second line of defense. You're okay. So do direct destruction in and of itself, okay? So we're gonna kind of break this down, but I want you to keep in mind, you have to know when something gets past the first line of defense. You have a whole series of these sensor systems, which are all meant to do that. Line of defense is made of your skin and your mucous membranes as the physical barriers, okay? Everything on the outside is covered with skin. Every point of entry is a mucous membrane. So whether that's your eyes, your nose, your ears connect to one, okay? Your mouth all the way through to your anus connects to, is, is a giant mucous membrane, okay? So we're covering the surfaces that are in obvious contact with the environment and then all of those internal surfaces that might come in contact as well, okay? Um, so you've got this component. Remember, your skin is really thick. All of these layers make it hard to get something through. Believe it or not, you know, I know it's easy to get like a paper cut or something like that. It's actually not that easy for some, for a microbe to go through your skin, right? Microbes can live on their skin, so they can stay on the surface. But in terms of their ability to penetrate through, they really need to, there has to be some sort of cut, some sort of damage, or you got like a mosquito that's gonna, you know, poke right on through it or something like that, okay? Um, you have all kinds of chemical components as well. So we've talked a little bit about some of these. So you've got acid in the stomach, okay? Um, going from your stomach into your upper intestine, there is a rapid pH change that happens because the stomach is really acidic but your intestines lose all of that acid. You've got to be able to absorb nutrients and stuff like that. You, you don't want all of that acid in your intestines. That rapid pH change is actually really as well antimicrobial because not a lot of organisms are going to be able to withstand that. It also means they're not coming up the opposite direction, okay? Because they hit a point where that pH is just not going to allow for their enzymes to function anymore. Um, you know, the flushing action of the urinary tract in and of itself is a way to prevent microorganisms from, from coming in and moving on, you know? You wanna prevent urinary tract infections, you need to drink a decent amount of fluids every day. You need to be going to the bathroom a decent amount and you need to be emptying your bladder when you do it. That flushing action helps to make sure that any bacteria that are there stay at the end of the urethra and don't end up migrating up into your bladder itself. Um, you know, you've got your skin, your skin's got all kinds of fatty acids that are in there to start with as well. In addition to the sweat, um, your lungs, your lungs are lined in these little, um, cilia. Okay. And it looks, there's a, an image on the next slide to me. It almost looks like seaweed, if you will, but it beats like this and it helps to bring things up and out. So when you get that urge in your mouth to cough, that's because you have chunk, too big a chunky particles in your lungs that your body is telling you those need to come up and out of the system because that could potentially get stuck there and make you sick. You know, um, you all got hairs up your nose that are meant to keep large particles out. Okay, uh, something flies in your eyes. You have those lovely eyelashes that are meant to try and block things as well, but you also have lysozyme in tears. Um, it also is in other secretions as well, which block uh, components. All of these areas are also going to include 
normal flora, okay? Um, normal flora is not a part of your immune system, but because those organisms compete for space and nutrients, they're naturally going to be antimicrobial to start with. They're gonna prevent potential pathogens from coming in. Working together. Um, you know, in addition to the fact that your skin is, you know, for the most part, water repellent, you've got all this keratin in there, you've got these components, but your body says that's not enough. We're gonna add in these extra things along with it, okay? Um, again, this is what you're looking at within your lungs. So you've got all of these cilia here, which move to try and block things uh, and prevent them from attaching. Uh, that mucus, that mucus is essentially, you know, it's bathing your mucous membranes. Microorganisms get stuck in there and then they get removed from your system. Doing okay so far? There are chemical barriers that are gonna happen. Okay, they come in lots of different forms. Uh, lysozyme is that component we talked about in the tears. It directly degrades peptidoglycan. Where is peptidoglycan found in bacteria? Cell wall, okay. It naturally pokes holes in the cell wall. What happens when you poke holes in a cell wall? What happens to the cell? It lyses, it dies, right? So you naturally make these antimicrobial compounds. Peroxidase, what type of molecule do you think that is? It's an enzyme. So what's it made of? Proteins. Something, right? Peroxidase in saliva, okay? Different body tissues. Um, some of your phagocytes actually secrete it, okay? So again, it's another antimicrobial factor that you are producing to help break down organisms, help um, change things. In addition, this guy is also going to break down hydrogen peroxide. It's going to make oxygen into a reactive compound. Remember, not all organisms can utilize or do something with oxygen in its reactive form. It's going to look for them, those organisms, um, to have uh, those, would they would have to have other enzymes to be able to survive with that reactive oxygen present. Um, you make compounds known as lactoferrin. It sequesters iron for microorganisms. So you get some organisms that come in and they actually lice open your red blood cells. They do that because they need the iron that's there. Lactoferrin is a compound that can be in blood and tissue fluids. It can also be found in saliva, but it takes that iron and it blocks it off. It makes it so that that required compound for microorganisms is not available for them to use. Yeah. A phagocyte is a type of white blood cell that engulfs and destroys cells that don't belong, other components. Yep, they just block it off. Yeah, they just make it like a barrier around it so that it's not reactively available. So you naturally make all kinds of different compounds that are helping with this process. Okay, we doing all right? So not only do we have the skin and the mucous membranes, but those chemical barriers are all sitting in that, in, in that environment, trying to help something from getting in. Also at your skin and mucous membranes, we're going to have a large amount of normal flora, okay? It's literally covering these surfaces. Your immune system are human cells only. Because normal flora will be bacterial cells, they are not your cells. They are not technically part of your immune system. However, they play a really important role, so you want them there, okay? Your norm, you have more normal flora cells than you have actual human cells in your own body, believe it or not. Your body is more bacteria than it is your own cells, okay? All because of these normal flora. And because remember, they're much smaller than your cells, okay? So they, you can get more of them in a smaller area, okay? Uh, but these guys are gonna work through competitive exclusion. They're competing for space and they're competing for nutrients, okay? 
We've seen this, we've grown cells on an auger plate, right? We talked about how the most dense areas in that auger are gonna have cells that are the least happy because they have the lowest ability to find nutrients, if you will, okay? So once you have those normal flora there, that's good because they're gonna start competing with all the other organisms that come in. You've got a spot and it's covered in normal flora and then a potential pathogen comes in, something that's gonna make you sick. That potential pathogen goes, well, there's no room for me here. Like, where am I supposed to go? What am I supposed to do? Because those good normal flora are in the way. This also brings back our discussion on antimicrobial drugs and when to take them and when not to take them and how we promote resistance in our body. We talked about that last week, right? Um, it's all coming back to this kind of stuff, okay? How are we feeling? So far, so good. Questions? When something gets past the first line of defense, you have a whole series of events that has to work to let the body know, A, there is an invader here, and B, here is where it is at, okay? All of your immune system cells and all of your body's cells can communicate with one another. Yes, they don't have the ability to talk to one another, but the way they do this is to send out chemical signals. So they release specific chemicals from those cells and those chemicals tell other cells what to do or what's there or how to work. Okay. Um, so those chemicals are basically just proteins and it's a specific type of protein known as a cytokine. Okay. So a cytokine is a chemical signal that's released that helps to tell other cells what to do. The cytokines from one cell are going to diffuse to another cell. That other cell, it's going to bind to that receptor. It's going to transmit a signal. And then that cell is going to do something else in return. Okay. I think of cytokines as little text messages. Okay. What do you do? The text goes to your phone. Okay, so that's like the receptor. You read the text and then you decide what to do. Okay. There's like 30 messages on my phone that have come through in the last hour. Okay. They're all work related, every one of them. Okay. But it's all like, what do we need? What do we have to do? I'm going to have to take the trash out in the lab upstairs. Okay, so now I know when I go upstairs, I gotta take the trash out. Um, here's one about gram staining. I apparently need to refill gram stain reagents as well. So like literally I've got a laundry list of tasks that I need to complete as a result of the text messages that are on, okay? When one cell says, okay, I need to tell somebody what's going on. Oops, I'm infected. I need to warn everybody. All it does is send out this cytokine. Those cytokines go to the other cells and the other cells go, okay, what's going on, right? Oh, that one's overreacting. Oh, that's not a big deal. Oops, there's a virus here. We need to make antiviral proteins or something else, okay? So all the cells in your body have the ability to send out cytokines. Those cytokines go to other cells and those other cells react. That is the second line of defense knows where to go and what to do. That's also how the second line of defense is gonna recruit the third line of defense and the third line of defense is gonna know what to do as well, okay? So it's all based on these little proteins, these little chemical signals that are sent out. Because it's a signal that's, that's diffused away, that chemical signal is gonna be highest towards the cell that's producing it. And it's gonna be lowest the farther away you go. 
So this is kind of like following a trail of breadcrumbs for some of these cells of the second line of defense. They see that chemical signal. They know they need to head towards it. They know that that's a sign that there's something there. And they go in the direction of the increasing chemical signal, chem keep going, keep going, keep going. As it gets in higher concentration, they're gonna find the cell that's producing that chemical signal, okay? Which are also made of protein, okay? Those surface receptors function as the eyes and ears to these different cytokines that are gonna come in and bind to them. The one difference is that I own one cell phone, okay? One of these cells can have hundreds of different receptors that are on the surface. Each receptor is specialized to get different chemical signals, okay? So this is like, you know, you got one phone that your mom uses. You got one phone that, you know, your significant other uses, another phone for every friend. You've got a back phone that, you know, Looking like I'm losing you here, okay? You got different receptors on the surface. Each one binds to a different cytokine. Sound good? When something gets in your body, your cells go, whoa, what is it? Where is it? And they send out an appropriate cytokine in response. There are hundreds of different possible cytokines. Right. If you think about, you know, have you ever sent the same exact text message, you know, twice, three times, whatever that is, right? Probably not. Same thing happens in your cell. You've got lots of different types of cytokines that can be sent out because those cytokines are all talking about a different exact situation. So don't memorize all of the different cytokines, but I want you to know there are lots of them that exist. So we had the question earlier, can we sample your white blood cells and kind of know what's going on? Yes. Guess what? When we take a blood sample, that also allows us to know which cytokines are being released and the percentage of cytokines that are there and the types of cytokines that are released can help them also understand what could be in the area and what's going on, okay? Cytokines do all kinds of different things. Some of them, have an effect that's just chemotaxis. We talked about this one. In response to a chemical, right? Your white blood cells need to know where to go. So they're just moving in response to that chemical. I roll. So they are gonna head in one direction or another based on whether there's a virus present. Okay. Others are gonna function for T cells and your B cells. So different text messages or different cytokines for different tasks. Marcel did. Yeah. Your cells have to know what kind of cytokine to send out. Because all cells in your body have different types of receptors on the surface. What binds to those receptors and where the receptors are help a cell know what's going on. They help your body know what's going on. So you have receptors that are on your cells. You also have proteins that are circulating through your blood. And together, those work in concert with one another to help you know exactly where something is at in any one point in time. Now, I'm not a real big fan of this diagram from your book, okay? but. Uh, your skin is everything in purple. The pink represents your mucous membranes. Anytime side of the pink or the purple area, okay, you have to be able to respond. You have to know where to go. Of sensor systems. The first type of sensor system 
is for your cells specifically. And these are known as your group one system. Every cell in your body has receptors outside and has receptors on the inside to help them know what's going on. Uh, specifically, you've got what are known as the toll-like receptors and the nod-like receptors. I'm gonna give you a difference between both of those in just a second, okay? All cells have these group one sensor systems. The group two sensor systems are in your blood. And that is known as what's called the complement system. This is a formal component of the second line of defense. It is going to act in response to stimuli to set off a chain reaction that's going to directly destroy or remove that particular invader. Okay. Yeah. So all cells have group one. All cells have group one. Group two is only found in your blood. A little bit of a better way of looking at it, okay? Allow you to see things outside of the cell. The toll-like receptor is like your ring camera, okay? It's looking at stuff outside of your house. All kinds of places outside. They're looking at outside your house. Toll-like receptors are looking for things outside. because it's all going to be specialized for what's binding. So you have one toll-like receptor that only can where is peptidoglycan found again? The cell wall. Side of what type of cells? Positive or gram negative? Positive. <laughs> Because gram negatives have what on the outside? LPS or that lipopolysaccharide, okay? So you actually have receptors, toll-like receptors that will help you know, okay, not only is it about but it's negative that's sticking out there. You can which would be found in Lagella, okay? It's not too complicated there. But you've got all of these different types of receptors on the surface that tell the cell exactly what's outside. They can't see it. They don't have any eyes. So by having these different receptors, that helps them know what's out there. You can also have them that happen on the inside of the cell. Typically, this is going to happen on the inside of an endosome or a compartment where those bacteria are coming in through, okay? Bacterial DNA. Why would you need some that detects single-stranded RNA or double-stranded RNA? What could those be binding to? What type of pathogen? Okay. Whatever could possibly be coming in. So it allows the cell to know, hey, not only is something here that I don't want, but also what is that type of organism? Every one of your cells has this. So you get strep throat. The cells that are lining your throat are all gonna go off with what that organism is. In this case, it's gram positive, so it's gonna detect that peptidoglycan on the outside, okay? You get infected with a virus, you get infected with COVID. The cells of your respiratory system can detect some of those components outside, but you will also have some inside the cell so it knows exactly which cells are infected with that virus. Make it sense? All of the cells in your body have these receptors. 
The receptors are what's connecting the first and the second lines of defense. When the receptors bind to something, something gets on the outside, a cytokine then gets released from the cell, okay? So this is gonna trigger into the second line of defense, which is going to include four components of the second line of defense, which we will detail what they are next week, okay? The last concept I want to leave you with is that we have to understand and remember your white blood cells are there to destroy things that don't belong. So the four components of the second line of defense that we're gonna talk about are gonna be mediated in one way or another by your white blood cells. Your white blood cells are moving around. They're looking to detect those chemical signals. They're looking to see and do chemotaxis and figure out where that particular invader is. They have to be able to go through all of your body, right? You can step on a nail or, you know, you can inhale something, right? You have to be able to fight off pathogens in both of those different locations. If I said you only have white blood cells in your core that can do anything, that's not going to do any good when you get a cut or something on any appendage, okay? So these guys go everywhere. Your white blood cells are not outside, but they're also trying to detect your cells themselves. Receptors on your surface that function as a marker that say, I belong to you. And your white blood cells are going around and they're looking for those markers. If it is a self marker, it says, I belong to you, and the white blood cell leaves it alone. the white blood cell has to eliminate it. So this could be bacteria that have gotten their way in your bloodstream. Those are non-self. White blood cell is gonna identify them, it's gonna eliminate them. This could be a virus through your body. It's gonna identify it and it's gonna delete it. This could be a host cell that's infected, that's no longer functioning like itself anymore. The white blood cell is gonna go, listen, I'm going to I'm going to destroy you because you're not normal anymore, okay? All versus non-self is not only like human, but it's you. Okay? So it's Rachel's white blood cell, okay? Ruthie's white blood cell. They they're looking for you. Get an organ transplant. There is an issue because your white blood cells go, okay, I see that it's human, but it doesn't belong. This is not yours. Is that what you were going to ask? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So they will be on those for the rest of their lives because their white blood cells can ultimately detect that they don't belong. When they find someone who's a match, they're looking for the markers. They're looking to see how many of those markers are as similar as possible so that we can make them all match, trying to prevent that rejection. But ultimately, there's never a 100% match unless you get a transplant from an identical twin. Yeah. Um, is this, uh, this might be a dumb question, but is this why like people have like specific blood types that they can receive? Is it because of these? It's partly because of this, because your red blood cells are going to have markers on the surface and they have to match. Okay. Yep. And that one, if they're called alleles, are they put back on everything with the markers? So the markers are known as antigens or antigenic receptors. Um, your alleles are the genes that determine the receptor. Okay. All right. How are we feeling? Did I see another hand up? Uh, yeah, so there's a question on the notes that says, like, what's the role of the surface receptor in a neighboring cell? Oh, it was in our. Yeah, on it. Wait, say it again. It was on our slide. It was, it's the eyes and the ears. All right, guys. So 